Welcome to the tutorial series on individualized treatment effect estimation. I'm Ahmed and I'll be giving you a tutorial on model selection for causal effect inference methods. The problem setup that we are dealing with is the problem of causal effect inference from observational data. In this setup, we have a certain intervention which can be a treatment or some policy action and we have a set of subjects each has individual features and traits. So this can be the age, weight, and blood pressure of a patient, or the certain consumption behavior of a customer. And we would like to estimate the effect of a certain intervention on individual patients on the basis of observational data. So observational data is a data set that we have collected in the past, which observed the effect of policy actions, interventions, or treatments on individual patients. So the mathematical framework that we use to deal with this setup is the potential outcomes framework. In this framework, we have an observational data set comprising three variables, xi, wi, and yi. xi is the features or individual traits of a given subject i. And for each subject, we have two potential outcomes, yi1 and yi0. YI1 corresponds to the subject's outcome with the treatment and YI0 corresponds to their outcome without the treatment. And for each subject, we observe a certain treatment assignment, WI. This is a binary indicator that indicates whether or not the subject has been assigned a treatment. Of course, in the observational data, we only observe the factual outcomes. That is to say, if the patient was assigned a treatment, we observe their outcome with the treatment. Otherwise, we observe their outcome without the treatment but we never observe both counterfactual outcomes. The problem of causal effect inference focuses on estimating the effect of the treatment on individual subjects. So that is to say, we want to estimate the difference between YI1 and YI0 given a certain realization of the patient feature. So why is this problem challenging and how does it differ from standard supervised learning? The first difference between causal effect inference and standard supervised learning is that here we are trying to estimate two functions instead of one function. The first function is f1 of x, which computes the outcome of patients given their features with the treatment, and f0 of x, which computes the outcomes of patients without the treatment. But we are actually not interested in estimating the individual response surfaces or functions we are interested in the difference between these two functions, which we call the causal effects. Another difference with standard supervised learning is that we are dealing with observational data where we actually don't see any labels. So for the n data points that we will observe in our data set, a fraction of these will have the outcome of patients with the treatment and another fraction will have the outcomes of patients without the treatment. And to add insult to injury, the distribution of these two different groups patients with the treatment and patients without the treatments are different because the policy that assigns treatments to patients in the real world is, ran is not random. It's not a randomized controlled trial. It's actually based on the, on the features of the individual patients. So over the past few years, there have been a number of methods that were developed to estimate the causal effects of treatments from observational data. Some of these methods use ideas from domain adaptation to balance the distributions of treated and untreated patients. Other methods use Gaussian processes or neural networks augmented with ideas from multitask learning to learn the two response surfaces F1 and F0. And other methods use generative adversarial networks. But in a real world scenario where we are actually trying to select a method to apply in our observational data, how would we know which method to use? which method would work best for the data set at hand. In standard supervised learning, this is a very easy to answer question. We can just apply cross-validation to validate the model performance. So in standard supervised learning, we can divide the data set into training data and validation or testing data. The validation data is a separate data set uh, or a held out data set that is not involved in training but is used to test the model performance. 
And because in supervised learning we have explicit labels, we can compare the model predictions with the actual labels that we observe in the validation data and have an empirical estimate of the model performance. And we can then confidently select a model to apply in the real world. But we don't have the same luxury in causal effect inference. And this is because we don't actually have labels. So if we have a held out validation data set, this held out data would not have actual causal effect inference, no ground truth for the causal effects, only factual outcomes. So because we don't observe counterfactual outcomes, validating and selecting models for causal effect inference for the data set at hand is a complicated problem. So to visualize the problem that we are trying to solve, consider the following figure where we have a set of models that we are trying to select from. And the true performance of a model is quantified by the mean square error between the estimated causal effect and the true causal effect. Of course, these are functions. So T of X is the causal effect of the treatment on patients as a function of their features, and T hat of X is the estimated causal effect. If we are to observe the true causal effect from the observational data, we can just come up with a validation sample and compute an empirical estimate of the true causal effect, and then we can just have a curve that depicts the performance of different models as a function of hyperparameters or modeling choices, and then pick the best one. But we actually don't observe this curve in, re in practice because we don't observe the counterfactual outcomes. So consider these two patients in a validation set. One patient was assigned a treatment, so we observe this red point, which is his outcome with the treatment. The other patient is a different kind of patient who have different features, who was not assigned the treatment. And for this, we observe the outcome without the treatment. If the model predicts these, these two curves as the outcome with and without the treatment, and the difference between these two curves are our predicted treatment effects, there is actually nothing to compare with in this validation sample in order to validate the accuracy of this prediction. So our objective for validating the performance of causal inference model is to come up with estimates of model performance. And to start by developing such an estimate, we first think of performance metrics, whether it's mean square error or any other metric, as a statistical functional. A functional is a function of a function. And the statistical function is a function of a distribution. So why the performance metric of any model, regardless of what this metric is, is a statistical functional. This is because the performance metric depends on the distribution of the features, the treatment assignments, the two potential outcomes. So it's a function of the distribution P of theta, where P of theta is a distribution of the observational data, including both factual and counterfactual outcomes. So if we are to compute an empirical measure for the mean square error or any other metric, we will need to observe both Y1 and Y0 the red and blue variables in this slide. This would be very similar to supervised learning where we actually just compare the true labels with predicted labels. And we have an empirical estimate of the model performance that has valid statistical properties such as consistency and efficiency. But because we don't observe both the blue and the red variables, we want to replace this empirical measure with something else that also have valid statistical properties. So the key idea of the method that we developed for validating causal inference methods is based on Taylor series expansion. So as you all know, in a Taylor series expansion, we can compute the value of a function at a given point using its value and the value of its derivatives, all of its high, higher order derivatives at a proximal point. So in this figure, if you want to compute the value of a function f of x at x1, we can compute this value based on its value at x0 and the derivatives of the function at x0. So without explicitly observing or computing the value of a function at f of x1, if we know its value at x0 and we can compute the derivatives of the function around x0, then we can reconstruct its value at a nearby point x1. So how does this relate to our problem? Here we construct an analogy between Taylor series approximation and the problem that we are trying to solve. We said previously that the performance of a causal inference model is a functional of the data generation distribution P theta. So think of theta as the x-axis, 
and the performance of a causal inference model as the y-axis. And there is a certain curve that relates both. So for different data generation distributions, we have different performances for a given uh, causal effect inference model. So even though we cannot evaluate the model performance on the true data generation distribution because we don't have an empirical measure for that, we can still evaluate it in a close enough distribution and then try to use a Taylor series expansion to approximate the model performance on the true distribution. The distributional analog of a Taylor series expansion for statistical functions is called the von Mises expansion. And this expansion decomposes a statistical function at a certain distribution parameterized by parameters theta1 in terms of the same functional evaluated at a different distribution parameterized by theta0. And instead of relating the functions through their derivatives, as it is in the case in the Taylor expansion, in the von Mises expansion, the statistical functional is related to the statistical functional at a proximal distributional and the influence functions of this functional evaluated at this proximal distribution. So you can think of the influence functions as the analog of derivatives for statistical functionals. They evaluate the rate of change of the functional with respect to changes in the distribution parameters. And this can be thought of as an analog of the concept of derivatives in calculus. And this type of calculus is called functional calculus. So the key idea here is that we can predict the performance of a causal inference model using the influence functions of its performance on a similar synthetic data set that is close enough to the original data set. And in this synthetic data set, we can synthesize the unobserved counterfactual outcomes. So in a nutshell, here's how we can estimate the performance of a causal inference model on an observational data set. On the left-hand side of this equation, we have the performance of the model on the true data set with parameters theta colored in blue. And the empirical measure for this true performance metric is inaccessible because we don't observe the counterfactual outcomes. But imagine that we have a synthetic data set with parameters theta tilde. Parameters are colored in red here. And this is a synthetic data set for which we can actually synthesize the counterfactual outcomes and obtain the actual empirical measure on the performance metric of the model on this synthetic data set. So having given this uh, synthetic data set, we can estimate the performance of the model on the true data set using a first order Taylor series like expansion where L theta of T hat equals to L theta tilde of T hat plus the first order influence function term. And this influence function term is the influence function evaluated for the statistical function L, which is in our case, the mean square error performance, which is evaluated at uh, the synthetic distribution theta tilde. And because we have access, we have full access to the synthetic distribution theta tilde, we can evaluate all of the two terms on the right hand side using their empirical measures. So this concept in statistics is called plug-in estimation. And to visualize how this would work, let's take this example where we have two data points for two patients. One was treated and one was not. And to evaluate the performance of a causal inference model on this data set, we start with a plug-in estimation step where we have a pl plug-in model T tilde. That's uh, a model that estimates the ground truth causal effects, which can be any initial causal inference model. And then we use this as the ground truth and just validate the performance of any given model as if t tilde is the ground, ground truth. And then there is a bias correction term, which corrects for the bias induced by using the plug-in estimation model as the ground truth instead of the true ground truth. And this bias correction term uses this influence function term that I've shown in the previous slide to correct for the bias in the empirical estimate of the model performance on the plugin labels. And this plugin model corresponds to a synthetic data set that we have shown in the previous example. There is an alternative way to interpret uh, this plugin estimation based way to validate causal inference model. And this relates to the concept of maximum likelihood estimation. So remember that in maximum likelihood estimation, where we have a parametric model and we want to estimate the parameter theta, we compute the scoring function, which is 
basically the log likelihood, uh, the derivatives of the log likelihood function of the model, and, and then try to solve the maximum likelihood estimating equation, which is finding theta for which s of theta equals zero. And in many cases, there is no closed form uh, solution to this equation. So we use a Taylor approximation to find a solution using the newton raphson method, where we take the an initial estimate theta zero, and then compute the derivative of the scoring function at theta zero. The der derivative of the scoring function at theta zero is the Fisher information as function of theta zero. And then using the Fisher information, we get an updated estimate theta one. And then again, we compute the derivative of the scoring function at theta one and so on until we converge to the solution of the maximum likelihood estimating equation. This is the case in parametric models. We can think of our approach based on influence function as computing the maximum likelihood model performance for a causal inference model, but in a non-parametric setting. And you can think of the Fisher information uh, function and the scoring function, the ratio being corresponding to uh, the expected value of the influence function. So essentially, when we create this synthetic data set and use the synthetic counterfactuals as ground truth for the causal effects, and then validate the model performance using this plugged in synthetic data and then correct for the plug and bias using influence functions. We are doing a kind of Taylor series approximation for the model performance on the true data set. And, but we can also understand this as uh, doing maximum likelihood estimation for the model performance in a non-parametric setting. And in the non-parametric setting, as we know from the difference between parametric and non-parametric statistics, the ratio between the uh, scoring function and the Fisher function is equal to the influence function. So basically what we are doing is that we are trying to compute the maximum likelihood estimate for the model performance uh, in a non-parametric setting. So what's the advantage of using this influence function based method compared to maybe a less complicated but rather ad hoc method where we could, for instance, impute the counterfactual outcomes and use this just as a ground truth uh, or maybe just evaluate the model performance on factual outcomes. So the advantage of using this method is, is that it provides like a valid statistical inferences of the model performance. Uh, so if you look at the properties of the estimator of the model performance based on the influence function, we show that it's consistent and that is efficient. Uh, more precisely, we show that if we include enough number of higher order influence function terms in our estimator, let's call this number M, uh, then we can achieve square root and consistent estimation of the model performance. Uh, and this is the best estimate that you could get for the model performance. It's comparable in terms of the statistical properties to the empirical measure of the model performance uh, in the case that you had the, observed the counterfactual outcomes. Uh, and the number of terms needed to ensure this consistency and efficiency properties uh, depends on the dimensionality of the data, D. So if we have very high dimension feature space, we need more influence, higher order influence function terms to be included in our estimator. It also de depends on the smoothness of the two response surfaces, the response of patients with the treatment and patients without the treatment. So even though it may be challenging in practice to actually compute these higher order influence function terms, we know that this estimation procedure is rigorous and gives you valid statistical inferences of the model performance. So having constructed this uh, model selection procedure for causal effect inference methods, we can come up with an automated causal inference system that takes all the different models that have been developed in the literature, predicts their performance on a given data set, and then uh, select the best model that is uh, thought to be the best for this data set at hand for practitioners to use in their analysis. And uh, we show in our paper, which I put a link uh, for in the last slide, uh, that if we look at uh, a large number of data sets, like 77 benchmark data sets, and we look at the performance of individual models and compare the performance of individual models to the best model that's being selected by our estimator at each uh, for each data set, we find that on average, using the model selection uh, procedure gives you uh, on average a better performance than any single model. You can also use this idea to construct ensembles of models or tune the hyperparameters of any single model because hyperparameter tuning can also be thought of 
as a model selection problem. So this concludes our tutorial session. If you want to learn more about the methods that I've presented in this tutorial, please refer to these papers and the references therein. And thank you so much for listening.